And we are officially live. What's up? It's Mike Wall, and welcome to another episode of the Agent Revolution podcast, where we deconstruct some of the biggest challenges facing today's real estate agents so that they can build a sustainable, profitable, and most of all, fulfilling real estate business. Super stoked today, man, because I got the Iron Man himself, my friend, Mr. John Kitchens, and we're talking leadership, discipline, and productivity. John Kitchens, welcome to the show, brother. What is up, man? What's happening? I appreciate uh, you uh, you having me on. I know you had mentioned uh, this long overdue, and it is, it is absolutely uh, long overdue. Absolutely, man. Well, I'm super excited, dude. I, I think I've been thinking a lot about this call today, and really what I've been thinking about is like, when you talk about leadership and productivity and discipline, you know, it is one thing I really want you to dive into today is I really want you to talk about having those things when times are good, because let's face it, man, the market's really good right now. And it's really easy to let complacency slip in and when you don't need those things. Yeah. And, and so like, I, I want to speak specifically to that so that when, you know, when people watch the show or listen to the show today, they can be cognizant of, of, you know, maybe if they've gotten out of the habit of, of being disciplined, um, that they can get back in and some of the things to look for. But before we do that, man, um, I know you don't need much of an introduction, but go ahead and give a, a quick uh, uh, background story on yourself, man, how you got into the industry and and toot your own horn for a minute. Man, you know, um, you know, for me, you know, Michael, Michael Reese is the connector. And uh, we go back junior high, high school days. And, um, you know, he uh, he's the one that connected me with Kinder back in uh, 2004. And he had caught wind, whatever I was doing, I was about to make I was about to make a make a pretty drastic move. And um, he went to Kinder and, and said, you got it. You got to You got to get this guy. And, um, you know, Jay, it's funny. Jay always tells the story. He's like, dude, I like he goes, I couldn't afford you. He's like because I told him, you know, I said, hey, this is where I need to be. And he said, I, he goes, I can't pay you that. And um, I, I said, well, well, you know, that's just kind of where I've got to be. And uh, sure enough, I mean, next day he's like, hey, when can you start? I said, well, I'm going to wrap up things with these boys and then uh, we'll get rocking and rolling. So that was October of 2004 that um, I got connected with Kinder and, you know, been uh, been fortunate enough to, to really, you know, get in. And, you know, I, I'm. The, I'm the guy that you, when you need when you need stabilization in your in your environment, you know the systems and processes that you need to really take take the business to the next level. Because, I mean, shoot, let's 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 you know, Kinder was successful, man. He you know in 2004 he closed out 340 units, but um, you know what was missing was the was was that next level of leadership, the systems, the processes that we need to stabilize the ship. And, you know, that allowed us to go to 430, 521 and, you know, over the next two years. And then that's, you know, the guys, you know, made the decision that, hey, you know, this is this is not that much fun. Let's let's start the coaching and training organization and get that company rolling. Yeah. And so that's that was kind of kind of that uh, path. And then um, I think in 2014, I made the jump down to Dallas where we kicked off the brokerage here in Dallas. Um, but before then. I got kicked in. Uh, I had the opportunity. We actually, you know, we just were what in our eighth year of of mastermind, which is pretty remarkable in itself. And um, after the very first mastermind event in um, February of uh, or January of 2012, we were in Aspen, and Kendra and I were about to catch catch our flight out. We were having breakfast, and he said, "Hey, man." You know, we just started this mastermind, and uh, we need somebody to coach these guys. Are you interested? And I was like. Man, half of these people call me on a on a on a weekly, if not daily basis. I said, "Yeah, man, you're gonna pay me now to talk to these guys." Yeah, I'll I'll take the gig. And uh, needless to say, here we are. Whatever you know, February of uh, 20, uh, 2012 to here we are today. And I'm I'm right at. We're keeping track, man. We're we're counting it down to ten thousand. I'm right at nine ninety ninety seven, almost ninety eight hundred one on one coaching calls in that time frame. Wow. So, and, uh, you know, it's, um, it's been amazing. You know, I just had a unique opportunity to, to look under the hood of, of some amazing agents over the years and their business. And, you know, it's, it's cool to see, you know, um, even with our connection at EXP, how many of the, the top, top agents that I've had the opportunity to work with, yeah. as well as some of the mega, the mega teams and agents across the country that, um, you know, 
got their got their start with us and their foundation and so it's really really cool um to to have been a little a little part of a lot of these uh a lot of these teams and organizations across the country kitchens man i hope people like one thing i know about you man um you're a super humble guy dude but i i, I can tell you this man i hope people really really connect to this call today because i i i think that by you're at 9800 one-on-one -on -one sessions and like i hope people realize what that really is 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 the amount of stuff that you must have learned not you know just because they always tell you the great the, you know the greatest students are the teachers right and, and vice versa but but like you learn so much when you teach it's like you must be i mean if, if we just if we just peeled you away and put you in a market it'd be amazing how quickly to see that you could build a team that was selling three to 500 homes a year. You know what I mean? I bet you could do it in like 18 months. It'd be insane. Yeah, fast. It's just, there's there's basic principles, right? There's basic step-by-step. -step. It's the systems and processes that we have that, um, you know, that we get tripped up. We, you know, it's the whole, you know, we have the recipe, but it's, you know, right things, right order to be able to get the outcome that we're, that we're after. And so it's, it's just, just understanding that. And, and, I think too, and you nailed it, um, you know, there right in the beginning and you talked about, you know, resting on our laurels when things are good. Yeah. And um, man, it's, it, it goes back to, you know, to coach Wooden and, you know, the number one, the number one indicator of success that, that he really instilled into his players and, and, you know, his teachings and everything as, as um, you know, he carried, carried on. Um, but it comes down to habits. And really the number one indicator of success is, is the quality of your habits. We all have them. Are they, how, are they either good? Are they serving you in a way that's helping you achieve the outcomes you're after? Or are, are they moving you in the opposite direction? And I think that's um, when things are tough, that's when, you're, that's when our, our habits get pressure tested. Right. How, how good are they when, when things are, you know, what, what, what are the quality of those habits when things are good? And, you know, the, the thing I was thinking about when, when I was, when I was talking to you about that earlier is that, you know, you know, you, 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 you don't necessarily, when a market's really good, like it is today, um, you have a tendency sometimes to get into or develop bad habits. Right. And, and you don't necessarily always pay for them right now. It, it, it's, it, and it's a little dangerous, man, because you don't know when the market's going to shift. Right. But if the market does shift and you still have bad habits, it could be detrimental to your business. Would you agree? Well, one hundred percent, absolutely one hundred percent, and it can happen fast. And you know, it's um, it's it's the whole, you know, even even like even on the personal development side of things, even even taking care of our bodies, right? You know, we might miss a few workouts here. We might not train for a week or two weeks, and you know, okay, I'm still feeling okay, but then, you know, the warning signs start to show. And if you don't do something about it, and that's even even in our business, you know, as things are good, the warning signs are there, right? You see, we see them even even when they're good. It's like you know, hey, you know, I'm not, we're not quite hitting, you know, our our KPI count. We're not quite hitting our calls. We're not quite hitting our appointments. We're not quite hitting our listings taken, right? We have the business. We're being really reactive to to what's going on, and we're just getting by. We're okay with it, but. Yeah. When when that react when that reactive business the business that we've attracted stops usually what happens when things get tough right in a market yeah then if you don't have the good habits to be able to be consistent I think that's the other key word too not only the quality of our habits but the consistency in our activities of those quality habits that produces the outcome and the desired result that we're that we're all after and and so when when those things change. Um, you know, good, good, bad, and different. That's that's when everything's revealed. And so, you know, for for us, that's what we're looking for: is maintaining the quality of our habits, maintain the consistency in the in those activities, and then just just making sure that we're measuring and correcting and improving and, and staying staying on the path of of whatever it is that we're wanting to accomplish. Yeah, and you know, it's so true, man. And it's true not not only for market cycles, but also also for uh, seasonal cycles as well, right? Like we are we're in the heat of the real estate market right now, and and everybody's operating account is is hopefully it, it is it is in good shape for the most part. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious, man. Like, 
if you if we if we could get through to that one guy or gal, that one broker or agent today, man, that um, you know is doing really good right now, but you know, um, how how do what are some of the warning signs? What are some of the things that they could look for to know that you know I might be a little off track here. I probably need to dial it back in. Yeah, I think uh, I think a couple a couple things. It all it all comes back down to you know quality and, and lead flow. Right, you know, is in in where is where is that lead flow coming from? And you know, something that that has been consistent that's starting to fall off. Um, you know, are are we paying attention to it? I think another thing too, you know, we talk a lot about you know distractions, right? There's a, there's so many more distractions um, going on today than than I think ever before, just because of you know the ease and you know the use of technology. But we always talk about, you know, distraction is not a distraction unless you give it the attention. And so being being clear on um, what it is that you truly want to accomplish and and not falling victim to that shiny object syndrome is is one of the is one of the key points. Mm -hmm. And so when you know your your main what is your main outcome, your main driver. So if we're speaking specifically to the real estate, the real estate business you know, we have to pay attention to, to lead flow. We have to pay attention to number of appointments. I mean, are things up, down, where are they at? And not just sticking our head in the sand or blindly not even paying attention to it because, you know, we, we, we see so many agents, Mike, and, and I mean, you know this, you see this as well, is that they they dictate, they, run, they try to run their life and their business on just what is in the checking account. Yeah. They're not paying attention to, you know, the warning signs on, on the front end um, that drives that bank account. And so that's that's where I would just like we've got it. You've got to create the visibility so you can so you can see to proactively manage the business and manage proactively manage cash flow yeah. to really maintain to what's going on in the business. You know, the cash the bank account is just I mean, that's <laughs> that's that's a, just a result that's not that's not anything that's within our control. Yeah. Within our control are those activities that produce the results. And this business, man, it's crazy. I, I don't know if it's just the entrepreneurial spirit, but but people want to complicate things and make this thing more complicated than what it is. Yeah. And you you know, to your point as well, it's like look, it's knowing the difference between leading indicators and lagging indicators, right? And you're so to when you're talking about people focus on the checking account. If your checking account gets too low, it's almost too late, man. You know what I mean? Because you know, you, you if, if you've not been focused on the right things like appointments, right, or, or you know, dials, contacts, appointments, nurtures, like if you're not if you're not focusing on those things, then by the time it carries over to the bank account, I mean, you could be out of business in a month or two. You know exactly. what I'm saying? Especially yeah. if it's if the market shifts or if the season shifts and you're not your operating account's not healthy, right? Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, this is, this is, this is the season time, right? Right now is the time to stack, stack the cash. We need to be thinking about Q1 and Q2 right now. Um, and this, and, you know, within, within the real estate cycle of things, I had a, you know, great conversation with a, with a client of ours this morning, you know, they're in a really seasonal market to where, you know, Q1 is tough. Q1 is super tough. And it's just, you know, being from, you know, just, just the climate, just kind of what's going on. Our home's going to still sell. Yes. But, you know, maybe four or five percent from a seasonal value happen in happen in, you know, that January four or five percent happen in February. So you better be thinking about that today. You know, stay stay present, love what's going on today. But you need to be dreaming and thinking about the future to to really make sure that you're prepared, because if if you go into that reactive mode, what, what, what I've seen that happens to people and it's just human nature. When, when things get tough, it's really hard for people to stay outcome driven, outcome focused, right? They get really retractive and they get into a scarcity mindset. And when we get into a scarcity mindset, that just, that just seizes up our ability to think creative and think solution, think, think outcome oriented. And so we really want to get, you know, stay in that abundance open mindset to where we're always thinking solution, always thinking progress, always thinking growth and um, just be thinking about the things that are going to come because yeah, I mean, if you're not, if you're not in a position, then, you know, you start to have to make hard decisions that, that most people are not good at making. 
Yeah, dude, that is golden, man. That is golden advice. And, and you know, it's a different conversation too, especially for people who, um, who you know, who maybe aren't in production anymore, and they're just they're you know, it's it's more of a CEO type. Uh, position versus, you know, the rock star agent or the rock star team agent who, you know, their margins are much larger. But, you know, when when you when you vacate your production, your your margins typically drop um, significantly. And so every decision you make is much more important, man. And, and, you know, Kendra said it before. I've done it myself where we've gotten we've gotten out of the business and had to get back in. Right. Because we yeah. didn't calculate those things out appropriately. One hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and what happens is that there's really two two ways within within you know the model is that when you're in the trenches and you're producing and you've got maybe a small tight knit team, you've got maybe six seven agents, eight agents. I mean, you're you're rocking profitability, and yeah. I mean overhead's low. Yeah, overhead's low. Your margins are high. Um, you know, where, where, where a lot of, where a lot of agents get in trouble. And this is the mistake we made is that you start looking at what you're compensating yourself when you're in production. Right. And, and so let's say you're, you're, you know, you're in production, you guys are rocking, you're paying yourself, I don't know, 10 K a month for simple numbers. And all of a sudden you start to say, okay, things I'm going to transition out. Well, if you don't adjust that income to accommodate of what you're doing, then that's where the cash starts to disappear pretty quick. Yeah. And so that's the whole market-based wage, understanding what you need to compensate yourself to maintain profitability in the business. And that's what a lot of people don't look at. And that's where they get in trouble. And that's where they get sucked back into the business. And that was the mistake we made is that, you know, we didn't adjust compensation when we came out of production. We kept paying ourselves the same that we were paying as if we were in there closing X number of deals a month. Yeah. And so that's where a lot of people get tripped up. And, you know, whatever it is that that you're going to do and pursue, you've got to make sure that your compensation is in alignment to what it is that you do inside of inside of the business. And, um, you know, really, really be careful with that, because if you're if you're overcompensating, overpaying yourself, it's got to come from somewhere. And where it usually comes from is it comes from the bottom line. Yeah. Is that the hardest thing to do? To transition from the, being a you know a, the rock star agent with the team into be, going out of production and, and just managing. Yeah, I mean you know ego ego gets in the way um, a lot. I think um, not understanding the numbers and financially how to how to offset and make that transition. You know the biggest thing that I see where where I've seen a lot of people that transition out of production is because they're chasing something else. Yeah, and so what happens when they go chase something else is that they fail on the leadership side of things within their organization. And, you know, it's, there, there are no business problems. There are only leadership problems. And so, for example, say, say you're starting up this other entity that becomes an opportunity through, because let's, let's face it, the more successful you become, things don't slow down. Things get busier because you have more opportunities coming at, coming at you. The, the more, you know, more market share you gain, the more, you know, um, whatever you gain threshold, brand recognition, mind share inside of your market, more doors are going to open. Mm -hmm. So if you're not clear on your vision, what it is that you want for your life, what you're wanting to accomplish, you're going to say yes to too many things. You're going to overcommit. Yeah. And, and so you go down this path and you, you, you stop focusing and leading on what got you the opportunities in the first place. Yeah. And usually you've developed some amazing relationship. You've you've hopefully poured into people that you've really been able to, to rise up. But what, what happens is that you don't really create leadership, that next level of leadership in your organization. And that in that whole other organization is depending upon you to still lead. And now when you're over here focused on this other opportunity, you stop leading over here. And when that leadership is gone, you know, people's, you know, start telling this different stories in their heads and it, they, they create their own belief and that, that turns into their behavior and turns into different actions. And, and that's where it usually starts to crumble. And so you've got to be careful when you start evaluating other opportunities. Do I have solid leadership in place to be able to lead if I kind of start to separate myself and focus on this other entity, this other opportunity. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's best that if they want to pursue this, 
Maybe they just shut this down if they don't have the leadership in place. And so it's just it's just hard to, you know, to if, if you don't have that that in place, it's hard to step away. Like Jay wouldn't have been able to get out if I wasn't there to be able to step in in that leadership role. And, and think about it, we groomed it, right? That was, that was 2011, 2012, when we, 2013, when we really got him 100% completely out, 2012, really. And so you look at that grooming period and development within, and, and of course, we're both growing along the way, but you, you know, when you look at that, at that transition out, that, those key things help as well. Yeah. Dude, it's a great segue into talking about leadership. So one of the questions I have is, um, are, are, are great real estate agents always good leaders? No. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. I mean, I've seen some, I've seen some really good, really good, uh, really good real estate agents and they're terrible, terrible, terrible leaders. Can you become a better leader? Um, one one hundred percent, and and reason is is that leader leadership is a skill. So anything that's a skill can be developed, mm -hmm. and that's what people have to understand, right? They they fall into this false belief that oh, leaders just these leaders are born. They were just born that way. Yeah. No, they were conditioned. They developed the skill set along the way to be able to be to be you know the leader that that they have become. Yeah. And so. I think it's a, it's adopting a, a set of beliefs um, and, you know, different, you know, ways that, you know, you go about, you know, communication. Um, I think one of the biggest key, key attributes of, you know, from a, from a leadership perspective is the ability to how, how they communicate, how well do they listen? Yeah. Right. That's the key. So what uh, for you, like, what, You've seen so much, man, and I'm sure you've seen people, you know, you've worked with people at all different levels in their business that so that transitional role when you talk about like, I mean, because ultimately you're, you're having to become a leader the moment you um, the moment you hire somebody. Right. I mean, in, in, in some respects, even if you're hiring an admin, you've got to be somewhat of a leader. Now, granted, that role changes and expands as you add more people. But like what how are you? what are you seeing is like the natural evolution of a good leader? How does someone naturally, you know, become a good leader? And I don't want to say naturally because I don't want to minimize how hard it is to actually lead because we all know it's, it's a very challenging um, task. Some people try to lead with fear and it usually never works. And, you know, usually the best leaders, like you said, they're people who really listen, but talk a little bit about that transition from, you know, being a solopreneur, right? Just being an agent into actually leading a team of, you know, maybe several, uh, several people. Yeah, that's no, great. That's a great question. I think, you know, really understanding what is, what is the true essence of leadership. And it's really just the ability to influence another, another human being, right? Yeah. Another, another person, another, you know, community, another environment. That's really what leadership is. And so where, where things start from a leadership perspective is always, it, it always starts with, with you. And it's always it's always internal. It's always the self leadership side of things, and so you know it's always it's always a good question to ask yourself. You know, would would I would I follow me, right? Would you know? And, and would I follow myself? And you know, if if the answer is is no, then it's like, well, who do I have to become to be the leader that that I would want to follow? Um, you know, would I want my kids to follow me? Right. And, and, and that's another thing too. You know, you, if you guys, you know, with kiddos, you are, you are a leader, right? Yeah. You, here's your opportunity to, to lead and influence your kiddos. So, um, you know, a couple of really good questions to, to constantly be thinking about, you know, from a leadership perspective is, you know, just, you know, how, how am I showing up each and every day? Yeah. And, you know, that's that's where a lot of a lot of people fail, you know, Mike, is because they just they they just haven't spent enough time, you know, leading leading themselves. Um, you know, a couple of the of the key skills that that we look to, you know, we really have to develop from the leadership side of things is is the emotional intelligence. And, you know, we hear a lot about it. It's a hot hot topic, and you know, we you know. A lot of, um, you know, transitional on the leadership side of things is more is more of that, you know, the, the emotional intelligence scale. But what the heck does that mean? And, you know, the one of the main the main attributes to 
to that um, e- emotional intelligence is self-awareness. Mm-hmm. And so being able to be aware of, you know, how we're showing up in the, in the moment, um, but also the ability to acknowledge how we're showing up in the moment. And so when we, when we can create that awareness within ourselves, we can catch ourselves. And then, and then once we have the awareness, we have the acknowledgement, then we, then we can do something about it. Right. We can, we can get back on track. Um, You know, there's, you know, self-regulation, you know, motivation, our social skills, and then, you know, empathy is are are, are the five key foundations that make up emotional intelligence and those are really some of the foundational key attributes of what what really makes you know from from a self-leadership standpoint and the reason that you want to focus on you and how you show up each and every day is because people are watching right i mean your team is paying attention you know and this goes back to the habits that we were talking about earlier And so think about this situation. You've seen the cycle. You've seen this enough. We get a little lazy on how we're showing up every day. Maybe we're showing up 10, 15 minutes late every day. That turns into 30, 45 minutes every day. And so our team sees that. And so they start to think that it's okay that they show up 10, 15 minutes late every day. Um, You cut out of the office a little bit early every day. They know where you're going. You're not going on appointments. And, and so they're like, okay, well, cool. It's cool that I get out of here a little bit. Now the market shifts and you're like, I'm committed. I'm disciplined. I'm getting back in here. We need to be back in here at eight 30 now making calls. Right. Hmm. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, three months ago, two months ago, you know, you were showing up an hour late. You were taking a two hour lunch. Right. And so People are paying attention, man. They're watching, you know, not only the habits that you're instilling, you're conditioning your team and the people around you to make, make that, make sure that, and think that that's okay. Yeah. And so it, it really is, man, you're on stage, you're on stage. When, when you, when you bring on that first admin, um, when you have kiddos, I mean, it's the job, right? It's the job to show up every day. It's just part of what comes with, um, comes with it. Yep. And man, dude, like I love the whole emotional um, intelligence conversation. Like, I mean, I could, I mean, we could dive into that for an hour because, you know, there are times when it's okay to be led by emotion, but in, in, in most instances, it's not. Um, And where being led by emotion can get you in trouble is on negotiations. um, When you take stuff personally, where I think it's okay to be led by emotion is when you're allowing it to drive you to do something, especially that's productive, right? And so it's a really fine line, though, that you cross because you can get into like, I mean, I had a one of my agents was in here today and we were talking about, you know, the guys, he's a he's a real estate agent and he's a real jerk, man. And he's very difficult to negotiate with. He's very stubborn. And, you know, the he wants his goal is to try to draw you in to his world. Right. And get you engaged in that back and forth. So if you give him that he's won essentially. Right. And like you have to understand what the goal of a negotiation is, is 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 to put the deal together if it can be put together. And if not, then everyone goes their separate ways. You can't get involved in that agent's world, that agent's story. You can't let them lead you um, because if they if you if if they draw you in, we lose control. Right. And essentially you're out of control and you don't you can't negotiate. You can't you know, you can't think logically when you're out of control. What do you think about that? I mean, we and we could go really deep into this, but what like what is what what do you think about like the whole you know EQ thing? I, I can gig out with you all day on this, man. This is like this is like the topic, and yeah. um, and so exactly everything you said right there is just self regulation, being able to control your emotions. Yeah. And so that's one of that's one of the, the key component, right? So let's let's go back. So self awareness, knowing your strengths, knowing your weaknesses, understanding to to acknowledge, and create the awareness, you know. In the moment, where are you at? Um, you know, being able to accept it, and then you can make a choice from there to moving forward. Yeah. Self-regulation, just exactly what you said, being able to control those emotions. Step yeah. back, step back from a second, okay? And you know, what's the goal? What's the intent? What are we trying to accomplish here? And be outcome focused on solutions instead of getting getting sucked into a contracted state to where you're trying to prove that you're right. Yeah. 
and that's and that's where he that's where you know it sounded like that situation where he was wanting uh, where where he likes to take folks. The other is motivation, man. And the thing that we have to understand is that motivation is internal. We can ins- be inspired, right? We can inspire others. But motivation is internal. So what is what is that that is that that's really going to to motivate you yourself, right? What is that big picture? What is that dream that you have? And another thing with motivation that's that's really amazing when you when you dive layers deeper is that we all have this like it's super it's it's way it's layers deep man you've got to get down there and um that there's there's somebody in our lives that we're we're trying to always get the recognition and approval from mm-hmm. or there's somebody that we're trying to prove wrong at all times in everything we do mm-hmm. and when you when you when you're okay with that that's where that motivation will come from and so what is that big, big goal? What is it that that is going to motivate you in times when things are hard and, and being able to find that, um, you know, that fourth leg of, of when you get into emotional intelligence is social skills, right? Mm-hmm. Being able to know when to shut up, essentially, yeah. right? Just understand how to how to communicate in, in a social environment, how to communicate with another human being. And then and then the big one, man, the big one of emotional intelligence is empathy. And, and, you know, if you can just be able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, you understand empathy. The, the best video, I, I show it every chance I get. Um, it's, you can jump on YouTube. It's uh, from the Cleveland, the Cleveland Clinic. And it's on empathy. And I'm it's, down. man, I like it. It gets me every time I watch it. And I bet I've watched it. I, I just, <laughs> I've only watched it about 10, 10, 12 times. And it's only because I've been caught to where I've had to watch it a couple of times, but like, man, like it'll, it'll, it'll get you. And, um, what essentially when you watch that, if you'll get it and you'll, in and, and that video alone, you'll get empathy, right? People talk about it, empathy, this, you know, Gary V's hot topic. I mean, shoot, he named his whole wine, wine brand after it called empathy, empathy wine. And um, you watch that video and you'll get it. You'll, you'll get empathy just like that. You're like, okay, got it. And, and when, when you get to that point, you'll be driving down the road and somebody will cut you off and it won't, it won't upset you because, man, you don't know what's going on with that dude, right? He might be you, – you don't know, right? He could have yeah. just had a bad day. He could have got fired. You know, his kid could be sick. It's just you don't know what's going on. Right. In, in another human being's life, the problems, the story, the, the things that they're dealing with. And, and who is it for, for us to judge? And so understanding those concepts um, and, and that that really is the power from, from an emotional intelligence standpoint. Yeah, empathy is huge, man. Uh, so here's one thing, because a lot of people that will watch this, they, they are running teams right now. And so I, what I want to hear you comment on is that we've all heard the old adage that people will do more to avoid pain than they will to gain pleasure. Okay. Like what, what, t- tell me like, how do you motivate people then if people will do more to avoid pain than they will to gain pleasure? So, um, you know, just take, just, just remember we can't motivate them. We can inspire them. And, yeah. and so we, you know, we took, we, uh, um, this is our, you know, this is, just John Chaplak read, read, you know, singing in my head. And he's like, um, you meet them where they're at. And so you have to take the time to get clear and, and find out where people are at in their lives yeah. and what, what they're wanting to accomplish. What are their goals? What are their goals? What do they want to accomplish? And, you know, help them get to that point. Yeah. Right? And, it's it, it it then is you know having having that conversation you know with them um and and getting the game plan together for them and what they want to accomplish yeah and then just providing the infrastructure the support um and and getting them to buy in to to that and then you know forming that that culture of of accountability you know creating the space for them to um come down to 
it's, it comes down to agreements, right? We talk about agreements versus expectations and, and, and we have, we have agree, we usually have agreements in place, but they're real muddy and they're not clear. And so what we're looking to do is find out what somebody wants to accomplish and then form the agreement on what, what that looks like. And the, the simplicity of an agreement can just be who's doing what by when, yeah. right? And, and then, you know, where, where you put the accountability place piece in place. And this is where, this is what, um, where people get tripped up on accountability. Accountability has three legs. Most people only think it's two who's doing, you're doing what by when, but the third leg to accountability is how am I going to know you got it done? Right. So, you know, Mike, you and I can sit here and form this agreement of what we're going to do in whatever relationship capacity, whatever it is. And we come to the agreement that you're going to do X, Y, and Z by this date. And then that's where it's usually left off. But for us to really nail that agreement and get clear on accountability is, and I'm going to let you know how I got it done. I'm, this is how, I'm, this is how you're going to know it got done. Yeah. And it could be in the form of, I'm going to shoot you this, this update. I'm going to text you this update. Um, we're going to create this dashboard. We're going to use whatever type of tool. The numbers will be in there. They'll be updated by five o'clock every day. So we'll have a daily, daily update on what's going on. That's your agreement. It can be whatever it is that you want to be, but it has to be those things. Yeah. Doing what by when and how, how are we all going to know it got done? And when you take the time to get crystal clear and form those type of agreements, Man, life is life is so much easier. Life is so much easier. Right. You know, give me an example why this is this is extremely powerful, and I'll just get it give it into a relationship capacity. You know, I'll catch times to where I get frustrated with Holly about something, right? And uh, you know, then then I'll have to step back for a second and be like, dude, you're such a you're such an idiot. Why are you getting upset with her? Like, you don't even have any agreement on that, right? She doesn't even know that. That is the thing. And you're getting upset, like bad on me. And then, so you step back for a second and then you're like, okay, well, you know, how can, does, does this need to be agreement or is this something that I can take care of? Or is this just something stupid that I just need to let go? And, um, it's, it's really, really powerful when you understand that concept, because then you can do the same thing with your, with your team. And usually what, what we have to understand is that people, people want to do good. I mean, I, I really, really believe that. And I don't think anybody wakes up thinking how they're going to sabotage your business. Mm -hmm. I think people wake up and try to figure out how they're going to solve their problems and what they're trying to accomplish. And, you know, there's some bad things that people do, but it's, it's not necessarily bad in their mind at the time. They just don't have the awareness to understand sometimes right and wrong. They're, they're looked out. They're looking for their survival. And so I don't think people wake up wanting to do bad. And so if something goes wrong and something didn't get accomplished, it's because we didn't have a clear agreement on it. And then the accountability piece is consequence or reward, right? So my, my question for you then is what drives better business behavior, consequence or reward? Man. Um, or do you have them both in place? I think, I think you have both. I think it's an evolution, right? I think, I think the progression that, that we're working towards, they, they both get results. They, so, so to answer, to, to answer your question, they both, they both get your, they, they both will get your results. Yeah. The thing that you have to, to figure out and be okay with is which one is the most sustainable, right? Yeah. Um, re, you know, consequence is, is, it's sure. negative, man. It, it, it like for me, like as a team leader, no one wants to have to hand down consequences. It's just not a fun. It's not a fun space to be in. Yep. You know what I mean. And rewards is almost always it, there's. It's it's associated with positivity, right? So, but it, it to your point, man. It's it's one of those conversations that you know that you have to have, right? Yep. It, it's unavoidable because usually people. I mean, consequences are there, right? They're in place because. You know, the, the reward is not always obtained and there has to be a, a consequence if like if you're if you have an agreement like what you said and the agreement's not followed or broken. Right. Yeah. One hundred percent. So so add, add a little more context to this. So it's it's all of the above and, and a couple more. 
And so it's, it's consequence, it's, it's the reward, um, it's understanding and making sure that we have compensation within our business aligned to the behavior that we want, okay? Compensation drives behavior, right? I mean, it's even, it's even what, you know, uh, Warren Buffett will, will tell you, you know, at the, at, the, at the shareholder is that, you know, if there's an incident, I think um, the story was at, at, the last, at the last shareholder or whatever it was, there was an issue with Wells Fargo or whatever, and he was going to talk about this, that, the other. And he just said, you know, th whatever the question was, was like, you know, how are you going to deal with that? Are you going to sell it off? What are you going to do? And, and he said, you know, the first thing I'm going to look at is where was, where was compensation misalignment, right? That caused that behavior because it's, it, it, you know, that's why when you look at, well, Hey man, I want some person to do this and that. I'm like, well, they'll be able to do this and that, but guess where they're going to gravitate and spend their time where the biggest upside and reward and the compensation is going to come from. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you have to understand is that's where people's attention and time and grab and where, where their focus gravitates towards is where the, the, the opportunity, because that's how compensation is aligned. The other piece to, to kind of go to, to, to that question is, man, they've got to be in pursuit of something bigger within your organization. What is, what is the impact that, that your organization is wanting to have? I mean, for, for your organization, company, team to thrive, there, there's got to be a solid vision stemming from your values. There's got to be a bigger purpose. There's got to be a, a mission that everybody's bought into that is really behind. Um, you know, your number one job as a leader is to, is to create and have this compelling vision of this organization in the future. And then the second step is to be able to articulate it in a way to get people to buy into it that really want to be a part of whatever it is that you're wanting to, to yeah. achieve and accomplish. So all, all of the above, I guess, is is the answer to to your question. They all they all have a they all have a piece in that in you know in the component there. Yeah. So it's it's like man, I can't believe like forty two minutes have passed. <laughs> that was quick, man. Um, but and and, and again, I, I mean, the whole behavioral thing. Like, I mean, one of my favorite books, I one of the best books I've ever read is uh, As a Man Think, if by Dr. James Allen. Is I've read it probably six or seven times. It's in. Um, Coupled with uh, from poverty to power, it's just a phenomenal read, man. And so, like to me, if I look back over the, you know, and I and I've not been doing this that long, but if I look back, you know, over the last four or five years, to, like that's when my business really changed. Is when I got the whole, um, when I got the whole emotional intelligence thing down, um, where people weren't you know, where I was getting into negotiations and I wasn't being led by my emotions anymore. It didn't matter what somebody said to me, you know what I mean? Because ultimately they had to own their own baggage and I had to own mine. And so I, I just knew I wasn't going to put that negativity out there anymore. You know, it was just about, it was, it was, the conversation was the means to an end, but the end was a goal, right? Everybody was trying to, I was trying to reach a goal. I wasn't trying to get into an argument or win. I was, we were trying to negotiate a deal, right? And so, my bit when I started to understand that, I hope people don't overlook this part of the of the conversation because it that that right there, that emotional intelligence part will do more for your business, in my opinion, than any other skill set. Would you agree? One hundred percent. Outcome over ego. That's a that's that's essentially what it is, right? We're we're trying to to get to right instead of be right, and um, that's that's hard. That's hard for a lot of people, especially a lot of a lot of people in sales. Um, that's, that's, it's really hard for them to be wrong, um, and, and, and really do what's in the best interest of the collective good to get to right instead of trying to force their agenda and be right. You could be wrong and be rich or be right and be broke. Right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, I mean, man, we, we're probably gonna have to do another one of these, man, for sure. Um, one thing I, I do want to talk to you about, like, is, like I have not heard your story about the whole EXP thing, man. You know, Jay and I have been on together. I, I've talked to Reese. I've talked to uh, Albie. Um, but like, I want to know how all this went down for you, man. Talk to me about that whole thing. Like, well, you are obviously, you're kind of, I mean, I've always looked at you as kind of the glue that holds everything together, man. And, you know, and, and, and so like, you saw all this behind the scenes. How did it happen for you? Yeah. So, you know, I've, I've coached Al, I've coached Al for, um, seven plus years now. So, you know, when this, when this thing all went down, 
you know, for us, we had the, we had the blinders on, we had a bigger, we had a bigger dream. We were chasing with what we were doing it in, you know, in Dallas with, uh, you know, the brokerage brokerage in Dallas and man, we scaled. I mean, we were, we were crashing and burning, you know, partner, partner and um, you know, call center and just the data play that we were doing and the technology, like, I mean, that's, that, that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. And, and so we, um, Al, the, the whole thing that went down with this is the fundamental team, the flaw in the team model is that you lose top talent out of the top. It's just, it's the number one team flaw. It's the thing that we've experienced. It's the thing that I've coached some of the most mega agents in the country over for the last, you know, seven, eight years. Top talent always comes out of the top because- Tell people what you mean by that. So we run out of opportunity when you run in a team model. And so most, most traditional, the traditional team style is usually, you know, you have that, that, that listing lead listing agent, which is usually you, you're the one going on the listings, company generated listings. And then you have a squad of buyers agents that maybe could, could grow into also doing listings themselves, but they're not really taking company generated listings. You run in 50, 50 split structure, 60, 40 split structure. And so what happens is that agents about years two to three years that they've been with you max five what happens is that they get start getting enough repeat referral business coming now yeah you can make the argument well i i gave them all that business they wouldn't have had that repeat referral business for me yeah but they nurtured that business they developed those relationships they've put in the work to stay in contact over the years now they're calling them and so what happens is that they start to do the math and they realize they realize that man, I don't want to work this damn hard for Mike, man. He's got me like out here, like busting it, man. I got to do, I got to close 50 transactions to hit my financial goal, or I can go over here and I'm doing enough repeat referral business to where I could do 25 deals and make the same money. People are lazy. They will take the path of least resistant 25 deals, 50 deals. I love Mike, but I'm going to go over here and do 25 deals and make the same amount of money. Yeah. That's what happens. So what had happened for Al now could, would we, would we still be here for with the, with the XP? Maybe, but the, the, the trigger was that Al lost his top two people. It's, it happens. It's the, I mean, everybody that has had a team, you, you've lost top people. And if you haven't, you're about to. And so that's gone. So what it forced Al was like, Oh my gosh. And, and this is what I said earlier, right? Most people get out of production because they're chasing another opportunity. Mm -hmm. Al had lost focus in leadership and he was over here leading, trying to get appointments today going, the call center. Mm -hmm. And so he had neglected some leadership and he wasn't meeting with his key people enough, wasn't beating that rhythm that he had when he was there every day. They leave. He gets, he, he now is opened, right? He's looking for solutions. Right. And he really looks at EXP. And so I just remember him shooting it over to me and calling and going through and, you know, so I've got my coaching hat on with him and I'm just poking holes and making him think through every scenario and it checked every box. And so we, um, we, he said, I'm, I'm going, I'm making the jump. And so I think Al, I think Al was right at two years and mine and mine and Kinder's anniversary date is November 1st. So we made the move in October. And so uh, we're, we're a few months behind and, um, we get on the phone with Brent Gove and Brent says, you know, he's talking through, God, we love, we love, we love Papa Brent, you know, and he's, the go -father, man. he's the go father. He is. Uh, we, I mean, he's amazing. I mean, he's oh, man. And so we get on the phone with him talking through and he's like, guys, just, just come to Fort Lauderdale, just come to Fort Lauderdale. And I was like, okay, cool. He's like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get you guys breakfast with the president, which was Vicky at the time. Yeah. And I'm going to get you guys lunch with the founder and then CEO, which is Glenn and, and Jason. Yeah. And then we're going to have, we're going to have drinks with the man that made it all possible, which is the goat right. Gene Frederick. Yeah. So we're like, okay, cool. And so we sat down it was good breakfast with Vicky is whatever. Um, but we sat back in there for lunch and I'm sitting, I mean, I, I mean, this, this is, I mean, this is, this is a story. I'm sitting right here. Kinder sitting right next to me. Glenn sitting right across from me. Jason sitting right next to him. Uh, Gove's over here in the corner. Al, Gadosh. Um, there's a few other folks. Um, Alex, there's a few other folks sitting in the room. And I was, I was kind of already in. 
right? I mean, like I had kind of gone through, I, we had discussions of what we're going to do with the brokerage, this, that, the other. I was like, I, I, I'm in. I think I'm in. And so this is why I was saying the compelling vision is so powerful because sitting there listening to Glenn share the vision that he has for this organization. And what's so cool is that there was such a mutual respect because Glenn had kind of been a student and following NAEA and Jay and Michael. So there was, it was a tremendous mutual respect. It was so cool. You could just, it was just, it was a cool energy, a cool vibe. But for me sitting there, listening to Glenn share the vision, share the story. Um, after, after we got done with launch, I looked at uh, Jay and I was like, I'm in. I mean, I'm, I'm 100% in because everything he said was so in alignment to who we are and who we were at NAEA and the things that we believed in and the things that we were pursuing. There's a better way, adding mass, massive value back to the community of real estate agents, changing and impacting lives. And it all connected. And I was like, that, that, that's, why, that's why vision is so important. Yeah. And I remember um, walking out of um, the shareholders and um, just um, in Orlando not too long ago. And um, I just I was just smiling and um, I, I walked over. I just told Jay and I told Al, I told, I told Gadosh as well. We were standing there and I said, <clears throat> I was just smiling. I was like, it's amazing to see everything that Glenn said in, in, in Fort Lauderdale that he was talking about the vision, everything that he was talking about is coming to fruition. Everything's happening. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's happening. It's like, holy shit. And so like the stuff that he's even shared that is not quite coming, I already know it's going to come. I mean, because he's making everything that he's talked about from a vision in adding massive value back into changing the real estate agents lives. It's, it's happening. And, um, you know, I, I Glenn, Glenn and, um, you know, um, uh, sorry, um, Gene and, um, Gove, you know, it's, this is not just another, it's not just another real estate company. I mean, this company changes lives Yeah, and, um, it's so amazing to be a part of and so amazing to see. And that was it for me. Um, once I, once I saw that and then, you know, like I said, Orlando was just confirmation that things are happening, you know, yeah. Glenn's doing what he said he was going to do. And such a great story, man. And the, and the same problem that it solved for Albie, it solved for me, right? And, and because we were getting ready to make a, a move to opening our own market center and for Keller Williams. And, you know, and, and the idea was presented to us. And really, while the move to Keller Williams would have been a more lucrative move for me initially, it was not a more lucrative move for my team members. That's and, it. Yep. And so ultimately my success would be dictated by the people that were on my team. So I had to make the move to EXP because it was a better opportunity for my people. I'm so glad you said that because that goes right back to leadership. You know, when you start bringing people on, it's not always about you. <clears throat> and that's where a lot of, that's a lot where a lot of folks are short sighted. And once they start to understand that it ain't, Here's the reality, man. When you have a team and people that that depend upon you and, and and really are looking for your leadership and your guidance, you work for them. You don't, they don't, they don't work for you. And the quicker that you can have that distinction, that realization, you start making decisions that what's best for them for their career. Right. Okay. If you're holding on and you're not and, and you're really still just focused on what's best for you, you're going to lose. And it's a long-term play, and you've got to take into consideration and be so mindful of what what's what's best for them into your decision making you win you win you win every day of the week and um, man i'm so glad to hear you say that that is uh, that's amazing well brother this has been so much fun man and and, and i think we're gonna have to do a part two and uh <laughs> maybe a part three for, for <laughs> <laughs> but, but dude, I, I always I always enjoy connecting with you. I can't wait to uh, to to see you in Las Vegas in, in a couple months, man. Um, John, I'm curious, man, if, if people want to get a hold of you, uh, if they have questions about, you know, you know, um, being more productive, being more disciplined, being a better leader, um, just anything as it relates to becoming a better real estate agent or team leader. How can they get in touch with you, brother? Yeah, man, head over to, um, <clears throat> they can just go to johnkitchens.co and, uh, man, schedule a call. Get on my calendar. The Calendly link is there. Um, get on, man, schedule a call. 
you know, just, just jump, schedule it on there. We'll talk through, establish maybe a kind of a, a clarity growth type call, um, give you some insight, help you really, you know, um, I, I like go, I like grow because, you know, if you, if you break it down, you know, Hey, you know, the G, Hey man, I get it. Right. And, uh, we're going to look at, and, and, and kind of based upon your goal, your stories, we're gonna look at the R give you some good recommendations. Um, you know, I'm going to help you get clear on what's working. So the O's will help you optimize what you're already doing. That's the biggest thing that we see with real estate agents. They stop doing things that are working. So really, really optimize what it is that, that you're working, uh, you know, what's working. And then, you know, W man is, um, find a way that we can work together and win, win together. That's, that's it, man. Let's grow. I love it. I love it. I love it. Make sure you get a hold of my man, John Kitchens. He is the real deal. As always, I love sharing these stories week after week because I know EXP is literally changing agents' financial lives, my own included. Do me a big favor. If you know someone that might enjoy this podcast, please share it with them. And if you like the podcast, please, please, please hit the subscribe button. If you want to learn more about EXP and why it's the fastest growing real estate company in the country or you're just interested in growing your business, Head on over to explodingwealth.com. And if you want to jump on a call with me to learn more about my business, go to meetmikewall.com. And that's it for this one, folks. Thank you, Mr. Kitchens. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. All right, brother. Boom.